to be here this morning. Most of you will probably know me, but if anybody doesn't, my name is Ian. Uh, I've been at St. Augustine's for many years. Um, many, many years, uh, until they kicked us out. Sorry, no, until we left to go and plant Lindbergh Road Community Church um, in the middle of a pandemic. You know, it's a great idea, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, it's been a little while since I was here taking a service, so it is brilliant to be with you. Um, I hope you had a good week last week, Easter. We did, yes. Good, good. Um, Easter being very transformational. Um, that's what we're going to think about this morning. Transformed people. So did you know this is one of the Sundays that I've lost count how many times I've preached on? This, the, the one after Easter? Do you know why? Because the vicar always takes it off. So I've got a stack of sermons on the road to Emmaus, Doubting Thomas, the other things that regularly come up at this one. What's the other Sunday for those who who follow these things that Vicar also has off? One after Christmas. They always do it. Um, So when when, when Al uh, contacted me and said, I'm taking this this Sunday off, would you mind... um, Take, uh, speaking for me. He said, I said, yeah, of course. And he, and he said, I'm not following a theme this week. We won't have started the next one. So you get to speak on whatever you want. Or oh, even better. So I don't have to do Doubting Thomas and I don't have to do The Road for Emmaus, although I might touch on them, one of them anyway, in a bit. I'm going to start talking from uh, a little bit earlier in one of the Gospels, from ch- uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. If you're following it, chapter 5, 27 to 32, it's on the screen. Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mm. 
Good, eh? See where we go with this. So, let me start off. Levi. Um, Levi is also known by another name. Do you know what that is? So you'll get to know this. I, I, I do question and answer quite a lot. And quite happy for you to uh, heckle. Sorry, who said that? I heard somebody say it. Matthew. Matthew. Yes, Matthew, as in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. As in disciple, as in gospel writer. Um, it, was, it wasn't that he changed his name, but he had two names. Like another guy, Paul, who wrote lots of things. His other name was... Saul. Yeah. We often think that Saul's name was changed to Paul because we tend to read in the earlier parts of it, he's named Saul, and in the latter parts, he's named Paul. Um, often, you know, Levi and Matthew. You know, we don't think of the Gospel of Levi, we think of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, actually, because it was a multilingual world, uh, people often had names in different languages. So, um, Matthew is his Greek name. Levi is his Hebrew name. So, uh, you know, obviously, when the Gospel was written, it was written in Greek. So it was going to use the name Matthew, not the name Levi. Um, so that's what we've got. So we've got this guy called Levi, who we now know who he is, and he was a lovely man. Uh, he used to collect taxes. There are two things that are uh, certain in life, aren't there? Death and taxes. And yes, this was one of them. Uh, tax collecting was not a very proud and upstanding and righteous profession at the time. Uh, you might have got that impression from the reading. Tax collectors were... Well, the, the land was occupied. The Romans have occupied the land and they've put a, a king in place who they control, a guy called Herod, and through it all, the Romans are, are basically taking the taxes for the most part. Some of it will go to Herod and actually what these tax collectors are doing is making sure there's a bit for them as well. So a tax collector would be there. They're seen by the general population as collaborators with the Romans and part of the state that everybody hates, um, and they're taking more money than they should. They're protected by guards and soldiers, because if they're collecting for the king, then the king will put soldiers there. If they're collecting for the Romans, the Romans will put soldiers there. And guess what? They'll be getting a little backhander as well, so they're going to protect their tax collector. Um, really didn't matter. Um, they were not going to be liked people. They liked each other because there was no one else to like them. Yeah, and they would have their own circle of, I don't know if friends is too strong a word for it, associates, um, people that they would spend time with because they're the only people that would spend time with them. There would be other tax collectors or other corrupt figures in society and this man who is corrupt, who steals from people, is the guy that Jesus walks up to and says, will you follow me? Just in that, there's hope for us all, isn't there? It's amazing. So, I, you know, I don't know what Levi had heard before about Jesus. He might have heard something of the rumours of who this man was. He might have been sitting near while Jesus was teaching other people or speaking to other people. He may have heard other things. I don't know from this. What I know is that Jesus went up to him and said, will you follow me? And he immediately left it all. This is a man who's been motivated by greed and by power, who's a thief, a collaborator, and he gets up and follows Jesus. He leaves it all. All that nice house, nice food, security, comfort, protection, all goes. And the first thing that he does is throw a party for Jesus. That's quite incredible, really, to me. He throws this party and he invites the only people that he can invite to come. We were the other tax collectors and collaborators and corrupt people and whatever, and they all come. In, in the, you know, under the law at the time and in society, it was really important who you associated with. And um, you could be outcast just for being associated with the wrong people. But Jesus doesn't turn away from this, Jesus sees this as an amazing opportunity to go and see and talk to and have a captive audience of the very people that he's, been, he's come to talk to, the very people he's come to save. It's 
amazing. He, sees it, he just sees it as a great opportunity. He's the guest of honour in this place. And the Pharisees and the tax collectors, sorry, tax, Pharisees and the teachers of the law, get it right, they don't like this. The Pharisees um, are an interesting group of people. Um, it, it's, if, if it was a pantomime and the Pharisees came on stage, it would be one of those things where very often in churches they'd get booed off, wouldn't they? Because they, they tend to turn up the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, always get a bit of a bad press. The Pharisees, as a group, as a sect within society at the time, weren't the worst by a long way. They were actually, uh, one of the things they were trying to do was find ways for the, the Jewish law, which was really hard to keep, to find ways for ordinary people to keep it and to try to match the two up so that you could be a good Jew and still be a fisherman, a farmer, or whatever it was you did. They, they were very much about being very practical about their faith. And as a result, they seem to turn up quite a lot, I think, because they are where people are. And Jesus is where people are. So they, they butt heads with Jesus on this. And on this occasion, they, they don't quite know what's going on. And they, they're worried, I think, that Jesus is going to associate with these people and then no one will take him seriously after that. Why would you go and sit and eat with these people? Because that means you're going to lose respect and you're not going to be taken seriously. But in fact, Jesus said, actually, these are the people I need to speak to because... It's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. I wonder what the, the Pharisees made of that. They would think of themselves as in quite a good place with regards to the Jewish law, with regards to where things were, were, you know, where they were with God, because they followed it. But Jesus is saying, you know, you think you're okay, but actually these are the people who know that they're not okay and they're the people who are listening to me, and they're the people that I've come to save, to show them there is another way. And maybe that's what Levi saw in Jesus. Levi knows that there's nothing really more in life for him than sitting in his tax-collecting booth, collecting money, living a nice life. But there's no more to it. There's no more going to happen. Maybe he recognised that his life was so far away from where it needed to be that Jesus was the only one to pull him out of it and only completely shifting everything that he did and everything he believed was going to help. It's great that he did his first mass evangelism event that very day as he threw the party and invited all those other people to listen to Jesus. I'd love to know how many of those other people who came heard what Jesus said and changed their ways, changed their lives, maybe even became disciples. Maybe not one of the 12, but maybe they did. Who knows? Maybe later on, you, know, you might recognise, you know, sometimes we need to hear something several times, don't we, before we take any notice of it. Uh, you know, maybe they, they heard Jesus this night and then a few years later, after uh, Jesus has died, gone back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, Matthew's out travelling, preaching, telling people about this amazing stuff Jesus did. Maybe they met up with him again then. Maybe they heard him speak then, and maybe then they were changed. Who knows? I'd love to know. Because Jesus is in this business of transformation. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus continues to do, is all about transformation. It's all about changing people and changing the world. The world changed on Good Friday. Three of my favourite words, if not my very favourite words in the Bible, that Jesus spoke were on Good Friday, when Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. It is complete. There is no more to be done. That's it. We've done it. A lot of people heard that and thought that was the end. And Jesus was saying no. We've done it. This is where it all starts again. This is where transformation has happened. And his closest friends, the disciples, didn't get it. They thought it was all over. And on Easter Day, the women went to the tomb. The women came back and told them, he's alive, he's not there. And what did the, all the male disciples say? 
don't be so stupid. Go back and make me breakfast. I don't know. I don't know what they said. It wasn't good, was it? It took them some time to realise that Jesus was alive. I said I'd come back to the Emmaus Road story. I, if, if you don't know it, there's, uh, the disciples are there Sunday afternoon. Jesus has gone. You know, we might as well go home again. They couldn't have gone home on the Saturday because that was the Sabbath. They weren't allowed to. So Sunday, off they go. And they're travelling sadly along the road, going home back to Emmaus. And a stranger walks up and walks with them and says, why are you sad? And they explain what's happened to Jesus. And this stranger with them starts to explain the scriptures, starts to explain what the prophets wrote, starts to explain what Jesus had said about himself and what difference it makes and that it's not the end but the beginning and eventually they get to where they're going and they go into an inn and they they invite this stranger to come and uh, stay with them and they sit down to eat and the stranger takes bread and breaks the bread just like he did at um, the last supper because the stranger is Jesus And at that moment, they recognise who he is. That whole time on the road, they have no idea that this is Jesus. They're so overcome with what's going on. As he breaks the bread, they see Jesus. Jesus disappears, and transformation happens. What was the transformation that happened to them? They became athletes. There's seven miles to Emmaus. This is evening. Jerusalem's gates would be closed at night. Between them seeing Jesus, breaking the bread... They got back to Jerusalem before the gates were closed. And they were back with the other disciples saying, it is amazing, we have just met Jesus. He was on the road, he explained all this stuff to us. And they meet other people who've had the same experience. All all this stuff is starting to kick off. And that group of disciples is being transformed again. Each of them were transformed when they first met Jesus. They continue being transformed. It doesn't stop. It keeps going. In life, it keeps going. We don't stop being transformed. It says, uh, Paul wrote, and that we are to be transformed and to go on being transformed. Don't stop. It doesn't stop. It keeps going. We continue being transformed. In those first days between Jesus rising, Easter day, and his ascension, Jesus is the one going around saying to people, look, I'm here, I'm alive. This is what's changed. This is how the world is different. And he does it in all sorts of ways. He eats with people, he talks with people, he walks with people, he has a drink with people, he he lives life. John's Gospel tells us, uh, what is it now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. John just puts a few in. There's a barbecue on the beach. There is so much stuff going on, but it's all centred on Jesus still. And then Jesus ascends back to heaven. And the disciples again are thinking, what do we do now? They're locked in an upper room ten days later after he's ascended. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and an explosion happens. Day one, 3,000 people are, are transformed. Their lives are transformed. They give their lives to Jesus. The world is different. These are people transformed by the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit living in them. And it still continues today. Jesus still transforms people and goes on transforming people. Leaves me, or leads me to a question. Let me ask you a question. If you are a Christian, think back to when you first met Jesus. What were you like before that? And how did Jesus change you? It could be different for all of us. Some of us grew up in a church and it was a gradual process, but maybe there was still a moment. Other people, it was like a blinding flash of light and the world changed. What do you think you'd be like if you hadn't met Jesus? Sometimes it's helpful to think about that gap between where you might be and where you are. But the challenge in it is where do you want Jesus to take you tomorrow? 
How open are you to continue to be transformed? Yeah, it's not a one-time only deal. I, I sometimes wonder, you know, if the disciples at Pentecost, 3,000 people were added to their number in one day. Amazing. They would praise God. That would be one, one amazing um, session. And after that, and for the following days and weeks and months and years, they were going and they were telling people and people's lives were being changed, just like that, overnight. They'd give their lives to Jesus. And I wonder how much the disciples thought that was kind of it, that once you'd done it, that was it. Because it took them some time to realise that the process goes on and continues and can take... Well, you, you don't know where God is going to take you. I, um, some of you might remember a bishop we had um, uh, quite a number of years ago, Bishop Clive, um, who uh, was a part of my journey to ordination. And he said to me uh, one day that, because uh, we, we were talking about what God's call was for me, and, and he said, you know, I absolutely agree with you, and, and you, know, we, you know, we both believe this is what God's calling you to, but always stay open to God's call changing, because God will take you on. God will take you to different places. God's call on your life will change. And I guess, you know, I think my answer was hallelujah, you know, this is good, because I don't want to stay the same. I want to go on. I want things to change. I want to find out what's around the next corner. I don't want to just stay in one place. I want to allow him to continue transforming me day by day by week, by month, by year. Who knows what comes next? There may be some people here who don't know Jesus personally yet. You may not call yourself a Christian. I don't know. Maybe something you've seen or heard this morning strikes a chord. Maybe you're thinking, oh, maybe I should. Maybe there is something in this. Maybe this Jesus has done something and I want to look into it. Um, Julie talked about Alpha. Um, that's one way to explore. One thing that we always like to do is give people opportunities to come to know Jesus. It's not complicated. It's you know, prayer. Prayer is one of those things that has quite a mystique about it, and it's really simple. It's talking to God. You know, we, we used to sing a song with the kids. Prayer is like a telephone. Just talk. Jesus wants to be your friend. How do you talk to a friend? You talk. You don't use special words. You don't have to do any special rituals. You just talk. There's no formula. So what I'm going to do in a minute, I'm going to pray a prayer that just says sorry for the things we've done wrong. Thanks Jesus for what he has done for us. Asks God to send his Holy Spirit to help us. I'm going to pray it and... For those who are Christians, I mean, if you're anything like me, you pray it along with me anyway, because it's just a brilliant way to remind ourselves what Jesus has done. If, you're, if you've never prayed it, if you've never prayed before, if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to, all you've got to do is echo the words in your head. It's as simple as that. Jesus hears. Jesus knows every one of us. He knows what's in our heart. Let's just bow our heads as we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. Thank you for what you did uh, that first Easter. Please forgive me as I turn from everything that I know is wrong. I thank you that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that I can be forgiven and I can be set free. Thank you that that gift of forgiveness is free and available to me. Along with the gift of your Holy Spirit. I receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit and be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. With everything inside of me, I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you've lost your hold on me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive sing a little Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roll. 
Hallelujah. 